All right, everybody, this is uh, the Sustainability and Resiliency Committee meeting. I'm John Strand, your chair. Let's just run around the room and introduce ourselves before we get going. Tim Mahoney, Mayor. Brenda Derrick, City Engineer. Paul Mathis, Cass County Electric Cooperative. Bruce Grubb, City of Fargo, Part-Time Administrator. Ben Dow, Director of Public Works. Sean Radnick, Inspections Director. Becky Majerus, Director of Facilities. Mark Williams, Fargo Planning. Shelley Byron, Note Taker, City of Fargo. And Jennifer, I'll let you introduce yourself if you can hear us okay. Yeah, hi, I'm Jen Sweatman, uh, member at large. Our very first presenter, if I remember right. Th thanks, Jennifer, for joining us online. And Greta will talk about schedules at the end. She's having a conflict this cycle. Uh, so we'll look at our meeting times toward the end of the meeting. And then I'll have one announcement that we'll make toward the end. So given that announcement, uh, adding an announcement and uh, an uh, update on meeting schedules, is there anything else to add to the agenda today? If not, we'll just go forward with the approval of the agenda. We don't need to do a vote on it or anything. Uh, let's do a vote, however, on the minutes. If there aren't any corrections, I'll entertain a motion to approve the last meeting minutes. Mr. Chairman, move to approve. Moved by Bruce. Is there a second? I will second. Second by Ben. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. All right. Um, Bruce, we'll turn it over to you for the presentation today. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our presenter today was suggested by SRC member uh, Becky Majerus, our uh, uh, facilities director, and uh, I'm very happy that he could join us today. And so um, I don't want to steal Becky's thunder. Becky, would be, you be so kind as to introduce our guest today, guest presenter? Um, yes, our presenter today is Dominic Hammer. He is from J&J &J Flooring. Um, in my previous position at Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Dakota, I worked with Dominic very closely um, on a huge flooring project for the Noridian Healthcare um, headquarters location. J&J uh, &J Flooring has a long history of sustainability. Um, they have both recycled products and they also have a program for um, sustainability for recycling the carpet products that they remove from facilities. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dominic um, and he's gonna talk a little bit about J&J &J and what they do um, as far as carpeting and their products and their sustainability for our environment. Thanks, Becky. <clears throat> so as Becky mentioned, my name's Dominic. Um, I'll teach you a little bit about the company, but a little bit about me. Uh, I've been on with J&J just over 11 years now um, as a territory manager, our, our manufacturing facilities down in Georgia, which we'll talk about. But I live here in South Fargo in um, just south of uh, Frontier now as the city has spilled south. My wife's a first grade teacher over in Moorhead, and we have three little kids that are in the public school system here. So when I'm not traveling the large geography I have, I'm home touring around town uh, busing kids to and from activities like probably a lot of the rest of you guys are. So a um, little bit about J&J. &J. So the, the company is the oldest commercial only flooring manufacturer in North America. So there's, there's other flooring manufacturers that are older, but there are, there are none that focus specifically on commercial products um, in that amount of time. So open since 1957, that makes us Oh, my, my public school math, would that be 65-ish years old? Um, does that sound right? <laughs> so long history of, of providing commercial products to the flooring or to the, to the nation, if you will. Um, as we have merged, so when we started in 57, we were a standalone company, but there's been some consolidation. We merged with a larger company called Engineered Floors. And now with that merger, we employ over 2,500 people. We've got uh, four large manufacturing facilities all within the Dalton, Georgia city limits. One of those buildings itself is over 2 million square feet. I think it's the largest, second largest building in Georgia behind like the Georgia dome. So big, big buildings, as you can kind of see on the map, um, we make a lot of flooring. We've been doing this for a long time. So 
what I think Becky wanted me to do today was obviously not as much of a sales pitch, but really just kind of teach you guys what the flooring industry at all has kind of done from a sustainability standpoint. They've done a really good job of producing products in a very sustainable way that's not harmful to our environment because uh, when you've got buildings and plants that are that large, if you're not doing things right, you know, certainly you can uh, uh, make a mess. So, um, all of our buildings are ISO 14001 certified. This is an ISO international uh, organization standard uh, parameter that basically states and is certified every year that these buildings have a very low environmental footprint. Um, so it's kind of a big deal for us to keep that certification every year and uh, produce our products in facilities that are ISO 14001 uh, certification. So that's kind of step one and then we'll get into some of the other things we do from a sustainability standpoint as we move forward here. So complete vertical integration. So <clears throat> from a standpoint of <laughs> so starts with raw nylon chip right? Just plastic chip is what it looks like. It's a polymer. From there, we make our own yarn. We tough, or we uh, process that yarn, stretch it, twist it, tuft it into a primary backing, apply a secondary backing, and ship it out the door. Um, so when you've got complete control of all of those manufacturing processes, you can, you can really have an idea of where your raw materials are coming from, the amount of waste you're producing, um, all of those things from start to finish from the very beginning of the manufacturing process until that stuff gets put on a truck and shipped to points unknown. You know, that's the closest thing I've ever seen to a, a newspaper press. <laughs> They're, they, you know, it is really largely what they look like is big newspaper press, but mm -hmm. where, you know, you've seen clips in movies where the press, the newspaper press is going like this, this stuff's moving through at about this speed, mm -hmm. which is good because... Uh, as we're manufacturing mostly a textile, right? It's just a large sweater for the floor. If there's a flaw in that, um, it's not moving so fast that they can't pause the machine and put a little hand mend or a hand tuft in those, in those products so that we don't have waste. So every manufacturer's got their own branded yarn. Ours is called Encore SD Ultima. Shaw's is called Echo, is it? Aquafil, Echo Work, I mean, uh, Mohawks, Durico. We've all got one that we've trademarked, but largely um, the way we're making it and what we're doing with it is uh, largely the same. The reason I bring this up is all of our yarn at J&J, &J, and I, I would imagine our competitors are largely similar in the, the numbers I'm about to present, but there's at least 25% pre-consumer recycled content in it. So that is recycled content that hasn't hit the mainstream before it is basically repurposed and put back into our products. So all, all yarns from almost all major manufacturers are going to have a, a, a good amount of recycled content in it um, from the get-go. The, the construction of that yarn is what we call trilobal. We don't make the yarn round because if it was round, right, like a, a water bottle, right, it would largely act like a magnifying glass for the dirt, which isn't what we want to do. So we make the yarn in that shape up there, which we call trilobal, and that kind of diffuses and diffracts the light as it goes into the carpet. So you can't see impediments, dirts, those types of things within the, within the material. Now, if you can see my mouse on the screen, there is this circle in the center. We basically, in the center of each yarn filament, we inject that recycled content into the very core and then the new yarn is wrapped around the outside giving us the consistent color so we're essentially hiding waste yarn in the middle so that we can achieve some recycled content in there so instead of taking this waste yarn and selling it off or yeah, using it as uh, uh, what do I want to say like energy burning it for energy we're actually injecting it into the core of each nylon fiber so that we're reusing our own waste within the plant itself um, as we start the manufacturing process. <clears throat> One of the products we used with Becky over at Noridian was this collection of products called the Paradigm Shift Collection. So as we would get done with the production run of carpet, there would always be leftover yarn. And you know, if you've only got two cones of green yarn and three cones of red yarn and 
one cone of yellow yarn, oftentimes what you're doing is you're you're selling that off for um, like they're down cycling it. They'll remelt it. They'll turn it into things like car parts, playground equipment, stuff like that. But it's all first quality yarn. So some smart Georgia Tech engineer down at the mill said, well, why don't we just twist all these yarn ends back together and then bury them into the background of a new product? And so that's largely what we did. So this is one of the styles in that collection. So what you can see is you've got a consistent color in the foreground. In this case, it'd be like that tannish brown. And then in the background, you've got these randomized yarns that are just leftover yarns from all the rest of our production runs. So instead of that stuff hitting the recycling stream or something else being done with them, we're burying them into the background of this style to um, just reuse our own waste, essentially. I can tell you, um, we use this at Noradian, and our background was a gray. Um, but what, what we'd asked our architect was to find something that would match all the different colors that we had going on in our large building. And this is what she came up with. And we had, you know, I mean, some of the some of the carpets had black in them. Some of them had blue, had more blues. Some of them had reds. But it really added interest to this mostly gray carpet. Um, and it really was very, very popular with our employees. And at the same time, it was something that kept waste out of the landfills, kept waste out of, you know, out of the environment. So it really was a popular choice for our building. Yep, it's, it's done well for us for a long time for a number of reasons. One, those multicolor yarns running through the background do a really good job of hiding soiling. So in between cleanings, the material just doesn't look as dirty as, say, another style that's very tonal or doesn't have as much uh, variegation going on in the background. Um, it's also just built really robustly, right? So it, it, it handles traffic incredibly well. Um, We've, uh, it's, it's just been good because those multicolored background yarns too tie together a lot of other finishes within your space without um, overwhelming or hurting your overall design intent. So it's done, it's done a good job for us. Is that what we have on these floors at all or no? Or You've got J&J &J in this building. This is not it. This is, I think, a Mannington product, but I know... Because Donna Tielstro, it's in it's somewhere around here. I, I toured this. I just can't remember exactly where all the J and J stuff you've got in here is. And bear with me, but are these designed so you can do segments if you need to repair an area or something? Yep. So carpet tile um, it has largely taken over the industry. I think when I first started with J and J eleven years ago, um, my product mix was probably sixty percent carpet tile, forty percent broadloom. Fast forward 11 years, I would say it's 85% carpet tile, 15% broadloom. Um, and if you think of it like from a logistics standpoint, let's say this carpet here somehow either gets burned or so damaged that, you know, it's easier just to replace it than to try to repair it. Grab a needle nose plier, find the corner of this carpet tile. The glue is releasable with enough pressure. Just peel that one off the floor, put a new one in its place, and, and off you go. So logistically for whether it's a city office, you know, a school, a hospital, like that helps not interrupt their workflow uh, greatly. Uh, as you move into larger metro areas, you think of a 57-story building and them trying to figure out how to get 12-foot wide rolls of carpet in and out of a freight elevator, much easier for them to roll in a 2-foot by 4-foot pallet of carpet tile, go into that building to repair and replace carpet um, within that space. Additionally, uh, take this room for example, if we were gonna redo this whole, this whole uh, conference area here, if we were doing broad loom roll carpet, all of the furniture needs to come out, demo the floor, put the new broad loom in, takes 24 hours for that glue to set up before you can come move furniture back in. Carpet tile, shove everything to one side of the room, carpet tile one half of the room, move that stuff over to this side, finish the other half, and spread everything back out, and you're, you're done. So logistically, carpet tile has really taken over the, the commercial flooring industry just because of its ease of use and the different things you can do with it. But good, good question. Can you talk about the process that you used um, in our cubicle area yes. uh, when you replaced the carpet? Yeah, so, so every, every building's got different challenges from a workflow standpoint. So at Noridian, I think a lot of call center type space and we just, we really couldn't dis disrupt their workflow during the day because, you know, they, they, they can't afford to shut down part of the call center. 
So we had a crew come in to do what we call a turnkey project where we just do everything from start to finish from the demo of the old material to the installation of the new material. And they worked in the evenings and we did it without disrupting um, or having to disconnect all of the systems furniture. So what they did was they'd come in, they'd lift the furniture about this far off the floor, which is far enough for them to work under, but not so far that it's disconnecting power or some of the other things within those workspaces. So they would lift the cubicle furniture up about this far, remove the old material, reprep the floor, put the new carpet tiles down, and then just lower the furniture back down in place. And they're able to do about two to 4,000 square feet a night in that manner. As you can imagine, it's a little slower, a little more tedious, but that way when the employees show back up in the morning, all that's changed is the carpet underneath their, their feet is different and none of the stuff in their cubicle is disrupted, nothing else is, is changed for them. So it's kind of a big deal from a workflow standpoint because they didn't have to, the facility doesn't have to worry about downtime. So far so good? Good questions so far. So we'll, we'll dig more into uh, some specification stuff in a second. The other thing J&J has done is we've developed a hybrid flooring surface called Kinetics. Um, that's kind of a first of its kind. It's been out for eight or nine years now. You guys have used some, Becky said, in the interstate parking at Mercantile. Is that right, Becky? Yeah. I think we've got some in your other facilities as well. It, yeah, okay. So what this is, is it's still a textile. It's still a soft surface good, but instead of the yarn being tufted vertically and us walking on the tips of the loops of the yarn, this is now laid down flat and knitted or woven. So it's actually constructed just like the seat belt in your car. It's called Rochelle weaving. So when we take that fiber and lay it down flat, we gain these incredible durability characteristics. It's completely <laughs> abrasion resistant, completely crush resistant, 100% stain resistant. So what you get is you get a surface that has the durability characteristics of a hard surface, but you still have all the soft surface benefits of acoustics, um, reduced slip fall injuries, um, comfort underfoot, anti-fatigue surface, those types of things. So it's called Kinetics. Um, these are the seven ways it advances flooring performance. So durability we talked about. Maintenance, you maintain it just like you would carpet. Health-wise, it sequesters airborne allergens just like carpet does. It keeps stuff out of the, what we call the breathing zone. Safety, it's highly slip resistant. Um, acoustically, it absorbs more sound than carpet even does. Comfort-wise, it is an anti-fatigue surface. And then sustainability, so we say it's as recyclable as an aluminum can because what we can do with Kinetics is when its useful life is over, you don't have to separate anything. So when, when we recycle carpet, which we'll talk about in a second as well, when they recycle it, we've got to separate the face fiber and the backing and recycle each separately because we've got nylon and we've got vinyl and those have to go into separate recycling streams. Kinetics is all made out of the same material, the face fiber and the backing. So when its useful life is over, we can just grind up that whole tile and turn it back into the next generation of itself. So we call that closed loop recycling as opposed to open loop recycling. Also, from a sustainability standpoint, the, uh, the recycled content in it has 45% post-consumer recycled content. So we talked about how our yarn has pre-consumer recycled content, which is us reusing our own waste yarn at the mill. <clears throat> this stuff actually takes stuff out of the current recycling stream. So each Kinetics tile has 27 recycled plastic water bottles in it. So a carton of Kinetics, um, as you can see the bottom bullet point there, uh, has the equivalent of about 492, you can round that up to about 500 water bottles in each carton of Kinetics that we have taken out of, whether it's the ocean or a recycling plant or wherever that is. So it's, um, from, a, from a sustainability standpoint, there's, there's really nothing better uh, out there. <clears throat> um, in addition, Kinetics is completely carbon neutral. So in addition, in addition to it just being uh, sustainably manufactured, I think we bought uh, the, the carbon neutral offsets to make it 100% carbon neutral, which is a cool aspect of it. And it's also uh, NSF 
uh, it's got the declare label, which means it's red list free. Um, if you're familiar with the red list, uh, largely started in California, I believe. Excuse me. Um, the red list is a list of, I believe it's forever chemicals, and this basically states that this contains zero forever chemicals. So J&J's sustainability slogan, if you will, I, uh, I know you guys can all read, I'm not gonna read it for you, this is kind of our marketing boilerplate in terms of our sustainability story, but I wanted to start with this here and then we'll kind of dive in um, just to a couple more bullet points on, on us. So I think it was in 2017, yeah, um, we were the first flooring manufacturer to be certified as zero waste to landfill, and we are still the only flooring manufacturer that's been certified as zero waste to landfill. One thing I'll point out was we received this certification three years in a row, and then the merger with engineered floors happened, and so the commercial division is still zero waste to landfill, but as we've integrated some of the things on the residential side, we haven't been able to keep that certification up until we um, reintegrate some of those things. So the certification party said, yes, the commercial side is still zero waste to landfill, but we look at you now as an entire entity of residential and commercial. So until you, sh until you shore a few things up, um, we're, we're working, long story short, we're working to reactivate that certification. On our, <coughs> on our website, um, this is part of the spec page. So we're just briefly gonna go through LEED and LEED certification. Is everyone kind of familiar with what a LEED building is, right? It's kind of the, the gold standard for make, uh, making a building sustainably. Um, NSF 140, which is the flooring standard. Um, I would compare this, this would be like the flooring equivalent of a LEED building. And we'll talk about Green Label Plus. This is the spec for the style I showed you here. So you can see this contains 56% pre-consumer recycled content just from us reusing our own waste yarn. So I just wanted to point that out to you. That's the, that stuff is listed on every product page on every product that we manufacture. So very, very easy, readily available to find for our architects, specifiers, and end users. So, Flooring alone can't get you a lead point. So as they build a building with lead, they, they score everything that they do to this building during the entire construction process. Flooring itself can't get you a point to contribute to that, or it can't get you a point, but it can contribute to getting you a point is I think the point I'm trying to make here. Um, so each one of these sections, um, we have documentation for for our architects and builders so that as they're scoring their building to figure out if their lead building is silver, gold, or platinum, they can use these attributes to add to that point tally. So it contributes in a number of ways from um, environmental product declarations, the raw materials in every product, the health product declarations, and then the green label plus. NSF 140 is again, so this pertains strictly to uh, NSF 140 itself is to flooring uh, as like lead is to buildings. So this just certifies and recognizes that uh, we've got products that meet a very stringent sustainability standard within just the flooring industry itself. So as you can see, Kinetics is NSF Platinum, which is the highest. The rest of our flooring products are gold. Um, we're continually working on that, figuring out what ways can we manufacture this to make everything platinum. Um, I have no doubt that over time we will we'll get there, but everything's a, a work in progress, as you can imagine. So we, we've got products that, again, every one of them is certified as NSF 140, whether it's gold or platinum, which is what most specifiers are looking for when they're looking for sustainably produced for it. Um, car carpet reclamation or recycling. Um, on our website, there is, it's, I think it's two clicks away. You click on the sustainability tab and then the recycling tab. This page comes up. Um, there's just a form you fill out. Whoops. You download the form, you fill it out, you return it to me or one of the gals at the mill. Um, we look at what you've, what you've got, put a quote together to figure out what the closest carpet recycling place is. And then we send you back a, a quote and a time frame to 
um, take that carpet and make sure it doesn't end up in a landfill somewhere. So pretty easy process. Not everyone obviously does it because there is a cost involved. And really, largely, the cost is just the cost of trucking from wherever you're at to get it to the closest reclamation center. And then recycling of our samples. So um, as we work on projects, lots of samples go out the door because people want to see this stuff. They, you know, they want to see bigger pieces of it. We want to make sure those samples don't end up in a landfill either. So with every sample order comes a sample return bag. And you can go on our website and just print off a UPS return label. So we will take those back at no charge to the customer or specifier. Um, we'd rather reuse them or recycle them ourselves than, uh, you know what I mean, for them to become clutter for somebody. You know, I tell people there's probably as much carbon that gets burned sending this stuff back to the mill as as uh, doing something else, else with it. So I usually encourage people to put them in like a hunting shack or a fishing shack before they <laughs> send them back to the mill, but we will take them back at no charge to uh, uh, make sure they don't end up in a landfill somewhere. Uh, and then adhesives. So obviously we talked about the material itself, but we got to stick this stuff to the floor. All of the products from whether it's us or Shaw or Mohawk, any of our competitors are now CRI, Green Label Plus certified, meaning they're not off-gassing VOCs, volatile organic compounds, in ways that are either going to disrupt um, your employees, right? You know, the, the nasty carpet smell that we used to have. That has largely gone away. So carpet doesn't off-gas. The adhesives we use don't off-gas, um, and the chemicals we use to make those adhesives aren't detrimental to the environment or to the people using the products themselves. So this just explains that Green Label Plus program that I just told you about. A lot of this is regulated, so like our regulatory body for the flooring industry is the Carpet and Rug Institute. They verify that the claims and practices we're doing are true and in good faith, and they kind of oversee the, old, the entire flooring industry at all. So if you're ever interested, they've got really great info from a both residential and commercial standpoint that will just give you a lot of great facts um, without any kind of sales or marketing pitch behind them. So kind of a nice reference for anyone just looking for general information on, on flooring. I put this in there just to point out, like, we're continually looking for ways to be greener and to, to be more sustainable. We have since mothballed this project, but um, up until a few years ago, we had this Aquafinity um, water recycling plant. So some of the older ways we used to make carpet were very water intensive. Um, we would almost, you know, you boil dye water. The heat in the water opens up the pores in the nylon, allows color to come through, um, and then that's how that carpet used to take on color. As we've gotten away from that manufacturing process, this became less, less important, but this Aquafinity plant we had would essentially recycle all of our own waste, uh, waste water. It would pull all the chemicals out of it. It would re-neutralize it with reverse osmosis, and then it would feed back into our plant so that we didn't have to use the Dalton City utility water um, because we were using a ton of water. So we were just, large story, long story short was, we were reusing all of our own wastewater um, as opposed to bringing that in from the city. But as we've moved to new manufacturing processes, we use so much less water now that we kind of take this, we took this system offline because it just wasn't beneficial anymore. So the point was we're, we're constantly looking for ways like how can we do what we're doing now better, more sustainable in the future. Questions? Are you related to Johnson & Johnson Medical? I'm not. So there's no connection at all or? No, the J&J &J was, uh, it was Jones and Jolly. Um, is it uh, Rollins Jolly and like Trent Jones? Two guys that started the company together back in 1957 is what the J stand for. Okay. Who has any comments or questions? Becky, how would you like to follow up on this? It's, thank you for bringing this to us, by the way. This is really, who would ever thought that carpeting and flooring would be so uh, relevant? Um, no, I just want to thank Dominic again for um, coming out and speaking. Um, like I said, I worked with him at a previous employer, 
And uh, that's what really brought to my attention everything that the flooring industry is doing, specifically J&J. &J. Um, I, I think that this is a product we want to continue using um, as long as it suits our needs, you know, and they have, they have the designs that we are looking for um, in future products or projects that we're doing. So I appreciate your time, Tom. No, Mike. thank you. Yeah, appreciate it, guys. Bruce. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> I was uh, heavily involved with the uh, design and bidding of this building twice. And um, I remember back in 19, I don't know, 94 or something like that, we put uh, carpet in the household hazardous waste building made of recycled uh, pop bottles. But, do you find architectural a building like this generally the owner hires an architect that serves as the lead they put together the design have interior people you get a materials list does this product compete in the marketplace with products made from virgin materials and stuff like that and how, how do how do architects you know people that specify stuff like floor covering uh, respond to this. It just seems kind of no brainer, but you know. Yeah. Um, it's a, I'm not going to say a loaded question, but. Yeah, it's loaded. It, it, it seems to mean more depending on where you're from, right? Like on the coasts where there's tons of people and lack of space and they're trying to do everything they can to conserve as much of their natural resources as they possibly can. Huge, huge hot button issue and has been for a long, long time. As you move inland, right, and we have more space and less people, not everyone cares about building a LEED certified building. You know what I mean? So it, it's kind of a case by case basis. I mean, we think it's important for everyone all the time um, just because of our natural resources, but not every project, you know, uh, cares as much about sustainability as, as maybe all of us should. Um, you know, just like anything else, sometimes it still comes down to cost or whatever it is. And, um, we have to be able to pivot and answer the needs of the market, whatever we're being asked. Um, while we're doing that, it's, it's good for us too, because the more sustainable we can manufacture this stuff, it's actually a big cost savings to us because we, we have none of this excess waste that we got to figure out what to do with, and, um, either sell off or, uh, get rid of. So it's, it's in our best, in, not just us, but really the flooring industry because the city of Dalton, Georgia is not big. It's probably about the size of Grand Forks and it produces, I think, 90 or 95% of the, like at least North America might even be the world's carpet. So they got to figure out a way to do this sustainably. Otherwise, they wouldn't have any room to put anything. So uh, can a typical consumer like me go into a, a local, uh, whether it's Lowe's or Home Depot, I mean, do you stock your product out there in the, in the industry where typical consumers would go looking for flooring? Yeah, yeah um, we are the largest flooring supplier to Home Depot. Um, okay. That's our number one account. That's under the Engineered Floors brand. It might say Dreamweaver is the, the actual residential stuff. On the commercial side, um, just about any flooring store in town that does commercial carpet knows who I am and knows our product. Okay. So. Um, yeah, if you walk in and ask for J and J, like that stuff's going to be up there right next to the Shaws and the Mohawks and the Tandises and the Manningtons. And, um, but that, that kind of goes back to your other question of how do the architects know? It's from us setting up meetings, teaching them about product processes, uh, initiatives, and things we're doing at the mill level. And then it's really you know people don't really like being sold to anymore. They just like being informed. So you do your best job as a rep of just informing them of, of who you are as a company and what you've got to offer, and then hopefully giving them enough good reasons to make a decision to work with you or work with your products is, is kind of how that ends up working. Yeah, and I think in this building, uh, we, we talked early on about LEED certification. But, of course, we had to build the building twice because, <laughs> you know, trying to save money and... Um, we all believe in lead, but there's there's money associated with achieving that. So you're kind of up again. Doesn't mean if you're not going to try achieve lead that you can't uh, install things that get you really close, which is kind of what we tried to do here. But 
but I think for getting lead certification for this building, it would involve another six-figure dollar investment yeah. that we... You know, you know how it is, money only goes so far. No, you're, you're absolutely correct, Bruce, because I've worked on a number of projects that did everything they needed to to get lead certified, but then they saw the price tag yeah. just to have that certification, and they went, you know, we built this thing as sustainably as we possibly could. Do we need... That certification stamped onto the side of the building, sometimes yes, sometimes, hey, we don't have the dollar bills for that. Because there, there definitely is a cost associated with getting that certification. So, Dominic, can you tell me a little bit, you know, we're, we work in the government world where every uh, penny and dollar is, is watched a little bit. And so is this product, as a recycled product, a cost comparison to, for the consumer versus the other products that are out there? Or is there a savings included if you do choose a product like this? So from our standpoint, think of some of the other entities we've got to work with, right? Like uh, we've got to make sure this stuff gets through GSA. So all of this stuff's on the GSA schedule. We're also part of the contract for the Air Force. Um, and then in addition, just to be able to do business in California, right? Like <laughs> there's, there's a lot of hurdles we got to get over. And we do a very good job. Like really the flooring industry at, at all does a really good job of doing all of those things, getting certified for all those things while still putting products in the marketplace that run a wide gamut of price points um, to be able to fit just about any city, state, federal budget. Because um, our largest business, what J&J &J was known for for decades, was we were the school carpet. Like any architect from 1960 to 1980, like J&J &J was at the top of their mind every time they built a school. So we had to make products that were incredibly durable, hit these budget price points within these, you know, um, you know, the schools are typically funded obviously by taxpayers. So it's in our best interest to make sure we're making products that fit those, those budgets allocated towards those schools. And then as you get into city government, uh, other types of work, they, they largely follow the same model, if you will. Um, so for you guys, you can obviously uh, procure our products open market. Otherwise, we're on a number of other contracts that like the city has access to that have already been pre-negotiated. Um, NCPA is the one that comes immediately to the top of my mind that we're on that we've worked with other city municipalities with. We're in an ag state, and I'm guessing and anticipating that someday we'll have a real ag shift where we sh we we have a presence of of industrial hemp at a at a major level, are you is your are you going that direction? Are there benefits if that opens up to the public to use that those materials? Uh, be, were you asking about hemp? hemp? Industrial hemp for your material uses. I know uh, some of our engineers. One of my last trips to the mill, it was something that they're I'm going to say they're toying with. Right? Um, we've got a lot of really smart people down in Georgia and believe me, if we can figure out how to make that commercially viable, um, they'll, they'll explore doing it because, um, that would be, I, I would think one of the greenest things that we could possibly produce mm -hmm. is figure out how to do that. I think the limitations for us are, um, can we grow enough hemp? Um, and how do you incorporate it while still meeting flame tests and some of these other things that we have to do to make sure we're, putting a product on the floor that's going to last a long time and then, you know, uh, not be detrimental in the long run. So I, I will tell you they're constantly doing R&D on those mm -hmm. types of things, trying to figure out is this going to be something that's commercially viable as we move forward. There's a fellow at our, ag, our land grant ag university we should connect you with. Maybe they can yeah. intersect their research with what yeah. you're doing. Who else, who else has anything else to questions or comments? It's really interesting. Dominic, uh, there's hammers up in Walsh County. Are you related to any of them? Uh, all, all mine up in uh, up in Roseau, actually. <laughs> are they? Okay, yeah, they're, yeah. Mom, they're probably mom's... distant cousins. Yeah, then. they probably are. <laughs> thank you very much, Bruce. Do you want to wrap up his presentation and we'll go forward? Yeah, thank you, Dominic. Um, uh, thank you for being here today. I thought you traveled from out of town, so uh, it's great that you're here. Uh, we'll follow up with more, uh, Becky and I, as we, yeah, if you guys, maybe Ben, we've got things out on the horizon that are coming that we know about that we'll need some sort of flooring. So, um, for our next meeting, we've not scheduled that yet. Uh, Greta Gramming said she's uh, uh, 
this semester she's got certain times where she's got class scheduled so I'd like to talk about that but earlier this week uh, Mike Redlinger and I met with uh, two members from uh, the uh, clean group um, and they would like to come to the SRC at our next mini meeting and uh, uh, present an idea to us that uh, they have they've actually circulated a, a petition and secured signatures uh, asking the city to consider a requirement for uh, EV chargers at uh, multifamily uh, uh, buildings and so on its idea they had that they wanted to bounce off us and they uh, uh, so we told them that uh, at our next meeting we would welcome that. So I hope everybody's okay with that uh, so we can hear about what their thoughts are. Obviously, they, they're they trying to get to, they, they uh, uh, see the direction that electric vehicles are going and try, you know, it's the chicken egg thing. What comes first, the vehicle itself or a way to fuel it? And so they have an idea they'd like to talk to us about uh, to see if that's something that the, city would consider not yet gone to Moorhead or West Fargo yet because we're kind of a metro area and, and try work together on things like that but uh, so there's no doubt that's coming our way uh, I don't know if any of you are into EV electric vehicle research or not but you don't have a charging station at your home or where you live how do you get a vehicle so this is really going to be a good relevant topic for us and maybe we can uh, see what role Fargo could play in, in that market and opening up more customers for electric use. <laughs> you know, I never understood that before. It's not just so much the electricity, it's the, it's the reduction of the contamination of the planet. You know, all the, all the reductions in the emissions and the, and the pollutions, that's really probably the value of electric vehicles, so that'll be a good topic. Anything else for Dominic? Thank you very, very much. Uh, okay, that, we will send a doodle poll out, maybe, Bruce, and yes. explore our meeting dates. We're also going to be talking about a school district replacement for, for Blake to come to the table, and, and we're brainstorming about some other people to bring into this, this mix. Personally, I'd like to have some, some young activists, that, you know, the people who are just passionate about climate and climate issues. And, you know, and I'll, I'll be frank, and, and I'm, I'm kind of disappointed in myself as the leader of this group because I'm not sure I've led us anywhere yet. I, I think we're, we're garnering a lot of information, we're learning a lot, and, and we're, you know, we're, we're kind of getting a sense of the lay of the land. But I'd like to challenge each of you or in your re outreach to people that you work with, what can we do? What suggestions are out there for something we can do? You know, what kind of action items can we contemplate that, that show that we're not just talking about issues? You know, um, and, and, and I think in the, the general sense, we found out that Fargo has really been way ahead of where we expected they'd be with regards to sustainability and resiliency and, and energy usage issues. But, but, but the world is, 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 is unfolding as things around us that, that compel us to step up our action at the local levels to, to, to mix, mix with the global action. So I, I personally challenge you all. To, to, to go back and talk to people, find out what they need, find out what some suggestions, let's come up with some ideas of things to do, because I know we have the capability at this table to, to, to vet and brainstorm and, and lead into something where we decide, let's, let's do this. Okay, Bruce, you have something? Uh, Mr. Chairman, yeah, I, th I think uh, what comes to mind is since we've formed, we've uh, forwarded on one recommendation to the city commission, and that's the uh, creation of carbon dashboards for city facilities. That was a tangible thing that Becky's working very hard on right now, but, but that's a way to measure the effect you're having relative to carbon based on improvements that you make. I, I think that's the sort of thing we'd like yes. to try to keep going. There's folks out there who say, well, declare a climate emergency. You know, I, I understand the, the mindset there to say there's a climate crisis going on, but I'd really rather have us 
act than just throw some ink on a piece of paper that says this is a crisis. You know, I, so I, I personally challenge you all to, to see if you have any ideas that we can start bringing forward. Any small ideas, they all add up. And, and uh, if there's anything we can do that kind of just shows we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, uh, go the path of some action items going forward. And it might mean, mean bringing some other people to the table, other meetings, other topics. Mary, you have something to? Well, it was just interesting. Jay Thomas did analysis of Tesla. And, of course, he's a little bit against electric cars. But, Ben, I'd be curious. You know, Ford has a new electric pickup coming out. Just the analysis of what does it cost and what does it cost on an early basis and what happens. Now, this guy who has a Tesla, he charges it, and his electric bill went from just for the house $400, $400 a month, so I'm assuming just a lot of electric heating or whatever, to $800 a month. So I was a little surprised that the Tesla cost that much just in recharging it. And then the second part was how long does it take to recharge? So if we had public vehicles, uh, he describes, you know, the length of time. You can't just drive to Minneapolis, stop at Alex, and recharge. It, it takes a while to recharge your vehicle. So it's not a simple 15-minute stop. It's a much longer stop. But, John, I'm just curious about, you know, if in public works we went into electric vehicles, what are the handicaps for that? You know, do you need a supercharger? Or do, what do you need? And they had a picture in the paper the other day that was kind of humorous to me because it was an electric vehicle going down the road with a portable uh, generator and two, uh, two t tanks of gas, basically, so that he could regenerate his electricity as he went because he was going on a 500-mile trip. But I'm just curious, Ben, I mean, you must do that analysis, and we found on buses it didn't work, but if we went to a fleet of vehicles that were electric for maintenance in the community, what are the handicaps to that? So currently the biggest handicaps that we're studying and we're trying to see the improvements come forward is really the cold weather and how it affects the batteries. And everybody's hearing that and how much heating capacity it takes to keep them warm when they're out in the elements. But we have vehicles that are going to become electric, all electric, and fleets that are going to be perfect for it. We have our solid waste fleet. That's going to be a perfect thing. And as we look towards the future in the next two or three years and building a new facility potentially for the solid waste, we need to make sure we're putting that infrastructure into that building so we're ready for it when it comes. It's going to come. It, it's, they're going to figure it out. There's smarter people than us out there. And so for us to put our heads in the sand and say, never going to happen, that, that's not where, where we're going. We have to prepare for the future. And so there's going to be applications. It's not a one thing fits all. You know, that's the, that's the key to it. Plow trucks are going to be a little tougher. There's a lot going on in there, but something that's repetitive goes out and runs its route for eight hours, 12 hours during a day, come in, park, charge it take it out the next day and the next day. And so th those things are coming. We're seeing street sweepers, all electric street sweepers are coming out because when are street sweepers used? In the summertime when it's warm out. So the city of New York is making some advancements in that right now. And I'm watching that right now and I'm actually meeting this evening with one of the owners of the company that owns Global Street Sweeping to discuss some of their advancements, some of the troubles they're having. But at the city of Fargo, we're always forced, not forced, but you know, it's ingrained in us to look for the next thing. The things that are out there, we have sales folks that come to us. I mean, we just bought our second um, sewer jet that recycles all the water it uses. So our sewer jets, when they used to go clean the sewers, they would they would run on a line that was 350 feet. They'd use up 2,500 gallons of water. You'd have to go back to the hydrant, refill, come back all day long. Now we can go out and we can fill once in the morning, and it captures all the water that they're putting through that sewer and recycling it all day long. So it only takes one hydrant fill versus repetitive, repetitive, repetitive. And we, like I said, we've just ordered our second one. It was one of the things we got uh, help funding through the uh, VW grant, half paid for through the grant. They're quite a bit more expensive, but when the grant pulls in and pulls 315,000 of it for us, then it's a cost savings. So those are the things we're doing every day that we don't bring it up because it's just natural to us. That's really interesting to get those updates because those things do add up. You know, uh, my, my, the thing that I'm reminded of in this shift in technology is back when CDs came out and everybody was using cassette tapes, you know, and you couldn't buy CDs uh, because nobody, you, you know, people didn't have the equipment. So it's, it's a chicken and egg thing. You have to have both. People aren't going to go buy the vehicles until the charging stations are there. They're not going to put the charging stations in there until the vehicle needs and uses are there. You know, there's some other things evolving. For example, 
in our community, people will pay attention to the, the infrastructure plan out of D.C., Washington, where the, I believe the tax credit for an EV, if you qualify t for tax credits, up to $7,500. Now, that's going to be an incentive for people to, to really move into this, but, but then they need to be able to charge at home. They need to be able to charge, you know, we have a station out here, but what happens if there's a line and it takes you an hour to get into the point where you're in the queue to get your car charged? I don't know what's coming, but this is a great topic. Let's keep focusing on that. That'll be a really, it'll be an electric conversation, so to speak, uh, alive, but one that's gonna probably unfold faster than we can anticipate. John, I think, there's there's a lot of discussion, a lot of things that Ben said that were that were true. I agreed with. There's a lot of challenges to overcome. I think that electric vehicles are coming. Um, it's just we need to be prepared for it from the utility standpoint. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that need to be looked at as infrastructure. You start requiring you know, buildings or service sizes to look at. Um, we own um, a Ford Lightning and we own a, a Chevy Bolt, so we have two all electric vehicles on our. Uh, and our fleet that we um, we were documented, we took a trip out to Minot with it, so I could share that presentation with you that we put together and the challenges that we face there. Um, and there's a couple of things with electric vehicles a lot of people don't understand that aren't in the electric business, and one is the energy and demand. Um, like you said, it takes a long time to charge. Um, people get impatient when they go to fill the car up with gas, it takes more than five minutes. Uh, level two, which is uh, one of the most economical charges between you know, there's such a wide variety of range of costs, but 600 to $5,000 uh, to put a level two charger in. And, and the, the chargers limit themselves, or the car limits it to a 90% charge. It only charges a 90% um, for the safety of the battery. And that could take eight to 15 hours on a level two. On a level three charger, and they're high demand, they're high capacity chargers, um, it's up to 45 minutes to charge that 90%. And from a utility standpoint, a level three charger is a very bad load for us. It's high demand and low energy. So what I mean by that is for 45 minutes, there's this huge surge of power requirement. So all the service has to be there, the wires, the poles, the transformers, the meter sockets, everything to serve that high load for a short period of time. And we call that a, uh, a load factor. And they have very low load factor. And for that, because of that, the energy rate and the cost that you're talking about it to charge uh, is very expensive because there's a demand component there that has to be paid for all our fixed costs. Um, you know, so there's a lot of there's a lot of challenges, um, and I, you know, I think there's and we get you know we post a lot of this stuff on our social media. We post a lot of it on our website and literature that we send out, and and we're hearing from a lot of people on both sides of the fence, right? Which we have to do. A lot of our members are we're getting a lot of pushback from businesses from our membership on pushing the EVs is all they tell us, and we're not, we're not, we're not doing that. We're, we want these vehicles, so we're the energy experts. We want to know how they work. We want to know the challenges. We want to know how the charging looks like. We want to know the load profiles, um, and there is challenges there, but when you know, we get pushback on the environmental side, or yeah, it doesn't burn fossil fuels. Uh, that's understandable, but it is a battery, and batteries are not a power source. Battery stores energy for a very short period of time, uh, the elements that are put into that battery, uh, cobalt, nickel, manganese, lithium, and where are those being mined and what is the mining processes um, that we, you know, we have to do the research, we have to know what this is when our members take us to task on this. And they're trying to shift away from cobalt and, and more nickel. Uh, so if you want to invest in the precious metal, I'd invest in the nickel. But where does nickel come from and who owns the majority of that resources is China and India. Uh, they have a stranglehold on a lot of precious metals. Um, and the mining processes that take place to do that in open pit mines where they have zero regulation. Um, so there's, you know, the electric vehicle is by far not a carbon-free uh, device. And so we have to look at all aspects, the 360 view of the people that are just want to put it everywhere and the people that don't want it. And so we're trying to roll down the middle and come up with the facts and the figures and what really it entails. And we're working with the ERC in Grand Forks right now uh, to do a study on what it looks like for our system if everybody owned an EV, if everyone owned a 7.7 .7 kW charger. Uh, for To get put that in perspective, your dryer is a 5 kW, your coal dryer is a 5 kW load. Uh, these chargers level two typically are around seven to eight. Um, so what does that look like if a whole neighborhood puts in, everybody puts these in, what does that look like for us? What do we need to do to our, our grid? What do we need to do our infrastructure to make sure that we're ready for that? And in, in the urban areas, we are ready for that. But 
Um, you know, what does that look like? So we're trying to prepare for that and prepare for the challenges. Another huge challenge, um, when people say they want the city to require these things, these chargers, um, or businesses, you know, one over challenge to overcome there is, you know, right now in the state of North Dakota, you cannot resell electricity. So who's going to own these devices? You know, we've talked about this is, we talk about this stuff all the time. Who's going to own the chargers? Are the utilities going to own them? Um, are they going to work with ChargePoint or uh, businesses like that? And how are we going to build that? Somebody could own a charger and get billed for electricity, and they could charge by the minute or charge by. You know, that's how. That's the kind of the, the workaround with that. But um, you know, there's also the gasoline tax that pays for all the roads and the infrastructure. There's that challenge to deal with. Um, you know, so it's it's not just a straightforward silver bullet here that we're dealing with. It's there's a lot of challenges in Cascade Electric's point of view is to look at the 360 and look at everything. And, and that's why we own these vehicles. We have them on our fleet. So we have real empirical data. And we're doing studies, like I said, on our infrastructure to make sure that we're ready for this. But a great topic. You know, that was a mini presentation right there. <laughs> you know, a really good one, Paul. I'm just, I'm just really champing at the bit to learn more about this topic. I, I recently heard uh, on a national news report that if, if we had this conversion happen now, generally speaking, we would need like 178% of our current electric capacity. In other words, we'd almost have to double the produced chem energy just to be able to service and provide these. And, and people out there think, oh, we're going to get rid of legacy uh, fossil fuels. We won't, you know, especially if we're demanding much more, that much more electric usage. So there's a balance. Really interesting stuff. We should, Bruce, we should really, let's keep going on this topic. Yeah, and, and Paul mentioning that they're uh, working on some sort of study with the EERC. Maybe somebody from the EERC could come down here and explain what they're doing. That might be really helpful for all of us. Some of those things that you just pointed out that the average person doesn't even think of. Good stuff. Anybody else, anything else on that? We'll, we'll follow up on that. And, and I think your topic, you're sharing your learning curve, your experience with your your own vehicles, how it's working, you're traveling across. And I think you've, maybe Duluth has done some electric vehicle work, I think. Yeah, ben. yeah. they went ahead and purchased, I believe it was about 10 electric buses. And then that, that took place about three, four years ago. Okay. And some of the experiences and challenges they're facing there. You know, the, the other thing I think about, all I think of with fleet and everything is, is life cycles. So that was one of the things when we did the charge point unit out here, you know, Basically, they said, do the five-year warranty bumper to bumper on it because that's about the life cycle, potentially, if it's a heavy-use charging station. So we're going to do all this infrastructure. We're going to put it all in, and everything's going to go in with all these charges across the state. But what's the long-term plan mm -hmm. to make sure they work, make sure they're getting replaced on a cycle, make sure everything it's there when they, the consumer needs it? So there, there's a lot of questions to be asked, and it's, it's one of those things that uh, what happens in five years? That's a great point, Ben. I think another thing for the city to be considering in states or, and whatever is what is the end game with the batteries. We had to replace the battery pack in that 2016 uh, Chevy Bolt, uh, the Volt already. Um, I'm not sure what they did. I'll check with our fleet guys. But if you guys, if you think you've, you add, there's what, 600 and 800,000 electric gas cars in the state. Say you had a half a million electric cars. And every five to 10 years, depending on the life cycle, there's gonna be some premature failures. All of a sudden you're having all these battery packs and their people are like, what do we do? Are they dumping them in? Are they going to the landfill? Or are we prepared for what we're gonna do with those batteries? You know, I don't have an answer for that, but it's just something that I think, another thing that we need to be thinking about. That's a looming question, for sure. So there's a lot for us to digest and discuss here. and. And yet to be uh, learn learn about so when we can go forward we, we do the best we can let's get let's let's keep that topic in front of us um, one last announcement from my a few weeks a few meetings ago we had Ro Roland from Elandu textile recycling present to us and and I'm just putting the word out as a favor uh, he's lost his location or will be losing his building so if anybody knows of a warehouse type building that this guy I went in and I visited it's just a warehouse full of bales of clothes and textiles they send to Africa. But, uh, but if, if anybody knows of a facility that might allow him to move his process, his recycling plant over there, he's, he's, he's losing his space. Ben, you have extra space, don't you? 
Why don't you uh, send them my way, John? So please. We send them, just give them my contact info if you would. We do some work with that economic development and working with the Fargo and West Fargo EDC. Uh, and there is a couple of really good websites I can't remember off the top of my head that the Fargo EDC has posted um, with various uh, sites that are available. So we can help them out with that. I'll do that, actually. Thank you. That's really interesting. Okay, anything else for the good of the order? We'll, uh, we'll, we'll doodle poll people for a meeting times. We'll, we'll, we want to accommodate Greta. One, one other quick thing. Um, and Mr. Chairman, you got a couple emails about our website content, and admittedly we, uh, we established that when the committee was put together and uh, some of the content's been outdated. So uh, next week, over the next couple of weeks, we'll try to refresh that and do a better job of posting the... Uh, the minutes, the the agendas, the minutes, and the videos, and we'll we'll hit a refresh on that so that the public knows when we're going to be meeting and that sort of thing. So okay, thank you, Bruce and Jennifer. Anything from you? If you're still there on on with us? Uh, no, I'm good. Thanks. Thank you very much for joining up with us. Uh, on that note, we'll just adjourn. Thanks, everyone.